Uh, we thought about how God made us with emotions. We thought about how they are uh, in and of themselves good things, but can be kind of warped uh, things. So we want to embrace them and live with them and live them out, but we want to grow in doing that well and rightly. That's what we're going to think about um, in this session. And to start off with, we want to think about where emotions come from. And this is where uh, the biblical understanding of how God makes us and the idea of our heart comes into play. Um, when we talk about the heart today, we often actually think of the heart as the place of emotion as opposed to the mind or the place of thinking. Uh, but biblically, uh, we're kind of, I don't know how to put it, we're kind of both more complicated but also more unified than that. The heart, biblically, is the kind of thinking, believing, feeling, desiring, longing, center of you. It's kind of what you really believe and so what you really want and think and live for in life. And so I've called it here the control center of life. Uh, that idea particularly comes from this verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 4.43, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Uh, the picture here is of the heart as the kind of um, a head of a stream. But some translations will say, guard, every, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So the idea is it's the start of a stream, and then you could, you could look at the stream flowing down the hill, and every bit of the stream you look at, you kind of go, well, every bit of this water, it all came from there. It all started there. You can trace it all back to there. That's a picture of our life. Everything you do flows from your heart. It's the wellspring. It's the origin. That's why the logic of the verse, above all else, guard your heart, because it's so influential. Everything you do flows from it. So of all the things to guard, of all the things to take seriously, take your heart seriously. Because all of your life comes from it. That means we live the lives we do and we have the emotions that we have because of our hearts. Now, you might be thinking immediately of some things that Jesus said similarly. He spoke of anything we say comes out of our hearts. Uh, or uh, Mark 7, for example, he talks about the heart as the origin. He's thinking there particularly of what we do wrong. And he lists lots of actions, sexual immorality and theft and so on. But he also lists what will be effectively emotions. The, the, the greed we feel that could lead to theft. Or the envy we might have of other people. And he says, where do they come from? They come from our hearts. Nobody else and nothing else makes us feel the way we do. It comes from our hearts. You know, we, we sometimes speak that way, don't we? They made me so angry. Yeah? Now, of course, what they were doing was infuriating. And, and it may have even been that anger is an appropriate response to them. But they didn't make you feel angry. Your heart chose to be angry in response. All of our life, including all of our emotions, flow from our hearts. It's the wellspring of life. So where do emotions come from? They come from our hearts. How does that work exactly? And here's where I don't, I, I don't have um, a Bible verse to show you. Um, it's, this is a kind of a fairly common understanding of how emotions work. And I think it fits with the Bible. And the verse I will show you, I'll, I'll give you an example of it. But I've, the heading there, it's just all about love. It's all about love and hate. To, um, to get you into this, let, let, let me tell you um, about our daughter, 
when she was, when she was born, she was given a teddy bear. Um, and as she grew up in her, you know, sort of toddler age and so on, she loved her teddy bear. She took it everywhere with her. And even, you know, six, seven, eight, etc. Teddy, imaginative name, <laughs> Teddy, was with her all the time. And uh, she played with it and served it tea and, you know, put it to bed and all sorts, you know, all the things. So we're on holiday one time and Teddy, of course, is with us and Teddy comes everywhere with us. And we get back home to the flat we're staying in and uh, Cara, our daughter, suddenly goes, where's Teddy? And she feels a bit worried. Can't find him. We search her out. Don't worry, he'll be here somewhere. He'll be in one of the bags. We search, etc., etc. We can't find him. She feels increasingly distressed and concerned. And we end up having to go, I think, I think we've lost Teddy. And now she's tearful and sad. And then we remember, you know, remember we went to the railway museum. Uh, you, didn't you put Teddy on the side? Maybe he's there. And now she feels hopeful. Maybe he'll be there. And in fact, we start joking about Teddy driving the trains during the night, you know, at the railway museum. Oh, and now she's feeling happy. So the next morning, we go back to the railway museum. And on the way, she's feeling a bit anxious, but anticipating, hoping looking forward to, and we arrive at the desk, did we have a teddy? Yes, we did find a teddy. Teddy's brought out, and now she grabs Teddy and hugs him, and she's delighted, and she's pleased. Now, do you see in that little story, she went through a whole range of emotions, all of which were driven by the fact she loved Teddy. She loses him, doesn't know where he is, she's worried, Decides he's lost, she's sad, thinks she might get him, she's hopeful, etc. All of our emotions come from what we love or conversely what we hate. I mean, take your health. Most of us, usually speaking, would, would love or at least value the idea of good health and be worried or hate the idea of disease. So you detect a lump. How do you feel? Worried, anxious, you don't know what it means. You go to the doctor, they say, oh, it's nothing. You feel reassured. They say, oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you feel more worried, and so on. Because you quite reasonably value, love your health and hate the opposite disease. Take any area of life, any object in life, any facet of life, that's how it works. And so the issue is, what love drives our emotion? So when I say that person made me angry because they're infuriating, what was driving it? Was it that actually they were being disrespectful to me and I love how I appear before others and actually, I was feeling embarrassed and so on because they were not being so annoying and whatever they were saying about me. Actually, it's my love of my own reputation and the fact that I can't shut them up and now I'm feeling angry. Or maybe they were saying something nasty about somebody else and it was my love of protecting their reputation and my concern they were harming somebody. That was making me angry. What love is driving your emotions? And so this quote from the church father Augustine, we do not so much ask whether a pious soul, is a Christian basically, we don't ask whether they're angry, as why he is angry. Not whether he is sad, but whence comes his sadness. Where does it come from? Not whether he is afraid, but what he fears. What is driving your emotion? What we saw earlier with Jesus was a whole variety of emotions being driven by a whole variety of different events. And he, he loved the idea of God as the author of life and hated the, the, the intrusion of death and the way that wrecks relationships. And so he cried at Lazarus' tomb. And he loved the fact that God opens people's eyes to the, to the plan of salvation and brings people uh, to, to know him. And so he was full of joy. 
So come to this verse from Luke 10. Um, Jesus sends out um, his disciples on a preaching tour. And he tells them what to say and he gives them authority uh, to preach the gospel and authority over demons and evil spirits and so on. And they come back to him and they come back, we're told, full of joy. And they say, full of joy, even the demons submitted to us in your name. And Jesus basically says, yes, I know, I've given you authority. It's like, that's, that, that was what I did, remember? I gave you that authority. Of course they did. And he goes on, do not rejoice that the demons submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now just think about that verse. What's he telling them to do? Don't rejoice that the demons submit to you. I, I take it that was a good thing. But don't, don't, don't value and love your newfound authority and ability more than your salvation. Your names are written in heaven. In fact, value and love your salvation so much more. Rejoice in that. Take delight in that above this. He's telling them effectively to reorder the loves of their heart. Love the fact your name is written in heaven more than love the fact that demons submit to you. And so rejoice in it more. I can't see another way of understanding that verse because you see the way emotions work, you can't just command your emotions like you can your actions. I can tell my hand to go from there to there and it does. It's amazing. Isn't that clever? I think it, it does it. But my heart... And my feelings feel joy, Graham. It hasn't worked. You can't just command joy like that. So how can Jesus say, don't rejoice in that, rejoice in this? He must be saying, love this more, value this more. You can't command your heart, but you can direct it. You can recalibrate it as to what it loves and values, and so what it rejoices in. Jesus' perfect emotions in each and every situation come simply from the fact he had a perfect heart that loved rightly. We do not. And so we need to recalibrate. Uh, let, me, let me give you some examples. Uh, number two here. Um, uh, just just, just four, four examples plucked from across um, the uh, New Testament, part of the Bible, which express some kind of emotion. Let's think together, what, what, what's, what's the love or value behind what's being expressed. So uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians saying, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. When I sit down and pray for you guys, I smile. I pray with joy and think, oh, that's so great to pray for the church in Philippi. Why? Because they're partnering with him in the gospel. It looks, they were actually, they were supporting him. They were sending him money. They were standing with him in the cause of the gospel. Why does Paul pray with joy? Because he values that. He loves that kind of partnership. And so when he thinks of it and sees it, he smiles. Later on in Philippians 1, uh, Paul is talking about the fact that some people, he's, he's in prison, and some people uh, are taking advantage of the fact he's in prison to kind of stir up trouble for him. Maybe they're saying, well, Paul, he's got himself in trouble again, hasn't he, or whatever. We're the ones who can really carry on this whole preaching of the gospel business. We don't need him. We don't know quite what they were saying, but they were doing something that in fact was quite unpleasant. But Paul says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. 
Now, you see, if I was in prison and people were saying something nasty about me, I wouldn't care how much evangelism they were doing. I'd be annoyed with them because I love my reputation more than the idea of Christ being preached. But Paul can go, no, no, I love the idea that Christ is being preached. So I don't don't think he doesn't care about their attitude. But Christ is being preached. That's so much more important. I'm rejoicing. Even though they're doing out of bad motives. Or James 1. Here's a challenging verse. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It's a very challenging verse. Consider these trials with joy. Rejoice in them. How can you possibly do that when the trial is a bad thing that hurts? Well, if you value and love what that trial is achieving in you, that it is producing perseverance, if you love perseverance more than your comfort, you'll be able to rejoice in the trial. That is not easy, but I think that's what he's saying. Or Galatians 4, Paul writes to the Galatian church and he's worried for the Galatian church about where they stand with respect to the gospel because they've started to believe a false gospel that is no gospel. It's a gospel about works, not about the grace of Christ. And so he's worried for them, and he says in chapter 4, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. He thinks about the, 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 the Philippians, and he prays with joy. He thinks about the Galatians, and he's in agony, because I don't know quite where you stand with Christ yet. And he He so hates the thought that they would turn away from Christ and is so longing for Christ to be formed properly in them. This is how he feels. These are just examples of what emotions come from our hearts, from what we love and value. I hope one thing this will do is as you go on reading the Bible in your, your, your own Bible reading and in small groups and so on, you might become slightly more alert to the emotional language of the Bible. The Bible deals in, in truth, in concepts, in doctrines, and expresses emotions. Like some parts of the Bible are more emotional than others. The Psalms, for example, are full of emotion. But here are, just, here are letters in the New Testament which mention it. As you read, look for that emotional language and ask yourself, what's behind it? What's driving it? What love is there that I should want to have for myself? Now, let's turn the page and come to number three and the influence of other factors. What have we said? We've said um, God made us with emotions. Emotions are good things. They are twisted by sin. We've seen perfect emotions in Jesus' life. They come from our hearts. Jesus had a perfect heart. He loved rightly, and so uh, he, um, uh, he expressed those right uh, emotions. He was sort of sin-free in his emotional life. Now, we're going to think about how we're going to grow in that in a moment, but I want to, want to do one thing first and think about the influence of other factors. Because within all of this, within all of our getting angry, rightly or wrongly, or rejoicing in our salvation, and so on, there are lots of factors that mean we will vary amongst us. And that's important to understand, both for understanding ourselves and understanding each other. And we vary basically in, in kind of how quickly we feel, how deeply we feel, and how we express how we feel. I mean, and I'm sure you'll know, sometimes we'll talk about someone as an emotional person. And they mean they probably feel things quite quickly, quite deeply, and express it. 
And somebody else will go, well, he's, you know, very unemotional, you know. And, you know, this person, we said earlier, we could think of this person as maybe a bit unstable and so on. And this person, you could say, well, they're steady. <laughs> you know, it depends on your language. What we want, though, is for each person, no matter who they are, to feel. And to feel sort of authentically, truly for who they are. And what are some of the factors that come in? Um, personality. God makes us different. Some of us are extrovert, loud, etc. Some of us are quiet, shy, and so on. Not right or wrong, different, just different. And that personality, part of that is, is how quickly, how deeply, and how freely we express emotion. Our background or upbringing. Some of us sort of had parents who told us not to cry or to have a stiff upper lip or something. Don't be a crybaby. Others of us have parents who say, no, let it out. Let it all out. We're not beholden to our background and our upbringing, but it will have shaped us. Our culture that we grow up in. And, you know, Br British culture classically was quite unemotional. Actually, that's changed in all sorts of ways. Watch, watch your average reality TV show where there's going to be a, 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 you know, a, a vote as to who gets kicked out and so on. And you ask a person, you know, what does it mean to you? And if you don't say it means everything and preferably cry about it, well, it's not, if someone just went, I don't mind really. It's not going to help their vote, is it? Actually, we respond more and more to expression of emotion. But go cross-cultural. Uh, watch, watch, for example, how a funeral is conducted in another culture. A, 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 a British culture, how do we do sadness and grief? Slow movements, quiet voices. So if someone screamed at a funeral, you'd kind of go, oh, goodness. Uh, other cultures, you're supposed to scream. You're supposed to wail. And so there's both a cultural permission and a cultural encouragement into expression of all sorts of emotion. We don't get to escape our own culture. That will shape us. And many of you will have people in your churches of lots of different cultures. That will shape how emotion gets expressed. Memories. Significant formative moments that have shaped us in some way. You know, you, I remember talking to someone once who was, became very tearful over hearing someone's death. And I thought, well, that's funny because I didn't really know them. But it reminded them of a very significant death in their history. Uh, tiredness, health, and dare I say, hormones. I dare. <laughs> I'll just talk about tiredness. <laughs> I, I'm, um, I mean, you know, just to take, 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 take me, personality, background, etc. Um, I'm, I'm half English. I'm half Welsh. Um, so I think in bullet points and I cry easily. <laughs> you know? I cry particularly easily when I'm tired. So it just, just takes a slightly poignant moment in a film and the kids will go, are you crying, Dad? <laughs> but I know if I cry really, I, it's a sign I'm tired. Other people, when they're really tired, shut down emotionally and just feel numb. That's not right or wrong. That's just how things affect us. Now look, here's the point. None of these are the origin of our emotions but they all shape how quickly, deeply, and expressive we are with our emotions. So I mustn't use them as an excuse. I'm sorry I shouted I was tired. That's not an excuse. It came from my heart. The fact I was so tired probably meant I shouted louder and more quickly. So it's, it, it's an explanation it's not an excuse, if you see the difference. I still need to apologise. And this then means that we understand something of ourselves and our own background and how we feel and how deeply we feel and how we express. And we understand each other. 
And we don't expect this to look the same for everybody. And that's really significant as we live life together in community of church and how we express emotion together in corporate worship, in Bible study, in counselling and care and sharing life and walking with each other. There's a lot of emotion expressed within your lives together, and there should be. But don't look to someone and think, well, well if they're not crying, that is, you know. Put it, put, it, put it differently. Jesus at Lazarus' tomb wept. Hypothesis, if he was of a different background, different culture, different personality, he might not have cried. He'd have still felt sad. What we want is for each of us to be authentic. Okay, let's move to growing in godly emotions. Godly emotions then are expected in the Christian life. And because of the way God has made us to feel and the way we will respond to situations and the way the Spirit will have renewed our hearts already, you can simply expect to feel good and godly emotions. A couple of examples. Uh, the Philippian jailer, Acts 16, the jailer hears the gospel. Uh, he comes to believe it. Uh, he brings um, Paul and Barnabas into his house. He sets a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole household. He's just filled with joy. It's almost as if he's, he, he just believed the gospel. and it, well, I'm, I'm full of joy now. Or Psalm 71, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have redeemed. It's like, I see, I see the redemption you've brought, I'm just going to shout for joy. There'll be lots of good things you rejoice in, in your salvation, in love being shown, and gospel being shared, and there'll be sad things that you cry over and sympathise with, and you don't have to, as it were, get to work on your hearts, it'll just happen, it'll just be expected, it'll come out of you. Great. Well Well done. You're doing well already in this. But just with what will come naturally, as it were, is not enough. Secondly, they're commanded. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Very similar to Jesus' call to rejoice. Your names are written in the book of life. We actually have to tell ourselves, rejoice in God, Graham. Rejoice in the salvation he's given you. Love that. Value that more. Value it more than what's going on in your life at the moment. Don't rejoice the Spirit submit to you. Rejoice the names are written in heaven. Turn your heart. Change your heart. And then thirdly, godly commotions are prayed for. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. God, please fill me and fill people in my small group and my church with joy and peace. Rejoicing in the truth of the gospel. Peace with you. Trust in your care. Please, will you do that for us? As we trust in you, we, we have to respond and trust. But God was the one doing it. This is part of our sanctification and God is ultimately behind it. And so we pray for him to be at work. Let me just finish with two very brief things because our time's almost gone. Finding the negative and promoting the positive. Um, I became aware a little while ago that Saturday mornings I was getting grumpy. Uh, Saturday mornings were my day off. I worked for a church, day off. I would get up and I would do a cooked breakfast for the, for, for the kids and myself. And um, Karis, my wife, very kindly and rightly pointed out to me um, at various points, I was wrecking what was supposed to be a nice breakfast with my putting the plate down firmly and from the door and stomping around. And well, you're, you're clearly grumpy. So there's a negative emotion that I want to fight. What was going on? Well, I reflected on it. It didn't take long to realize, actually that actually I thought of my day off as my day off, the day where everything should work for me because I've been working really hard all week. And, everything, and I'm going to serve my children by cooking them a breakfast so everyone should basically make sure it all happens perfectly. And all it would take is a child to be slightly late, you know, call them to come down because it's ready and I've cooked it for you and it's my day off and it should all work. 
and now you're late, and I'm... I was valuing and loving kind of my precious time off and it all being as I wanted. I wasn't valuing and loving time together as a family. But actually seeing that and trying to fight that negative, just praying before I came downstairs, Father, help me just love my family and value good relationships above how quickly someone lays the table. Promoting the positive. So for you, think of a negative emotion you'd like to fight. Ask yourself, where does that come from? How do I want to recalibrate my heart? Or we don't just want to get rid of negative stuff, we want to promote positive. So we want to just weed out bad stuff, we want to plant good stuff. I want to rejoice in my salvation more. So what do I need to do? I need to reflect on what God has done. That I was dead in my sin. That he looked on me with grace and kindness. That Jesus bled and died in my place. And you'll know this, the more you reflect on such truths, the more we sing such truths. Those are the moments our heart starts to value such things and then I rejoice. Um, Karis and I are doing some um, uh, um, memory verses, uh, 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 memorizing some verses together at the moment. The one we're on at the moment is from Psalm 63. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I want to sit, sit there each morning and say to myself, your love is better than life. I want to rejoice in that. Fight the negative. Promote the positive. We can and we should grow in godly emotions. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for how you've made us. Please, in your kindness, work in us by your Spirit. Help us love and value what we should as you do. Help us understand and see uh, what we love and value wrongly and how that flows out in our lives, particularly in our emotions. Help us, Father, in your kindness to grow in this area and so become more and more like the Lord Jesus. Amen.